Chapter Six of Queen Victoria by E. Gordon Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Chapter Six: Strife. Two men I honour, and no third. First, the toil-worn craftsman that, with earth-made implement, laboriously conquers the earth and makes her man's. A second man I honour, and still more highly him who is seen toiling for the spiritually indispensable, not daily bread, but the bread of life. Unspeakably touching is it, however, when I find both dignities united, and he that must toil outwardly for the lowest of man's wants is also toiling inwardly for the highest. To understand the many and bewildering changes which followed one another in rapid succession during the early years of Victoria's reign, it is necessary to read the literature more especially the works of those writers who took a deep and lasting interest in the lives and work of the people. Democracy, the people, or the toiling class, was engaged in a fierce battle with those forces which it held to be its natural enemies. It was a battle of the rich against the poor, of the masters against the men, of right against might. England was a sick nation, at war with itself, and Chartism and the Chartists was some of the signs of the disease. The early Victorian age is the age of Thomas Carlyle, the stern, grim prophet, who, undaunted by poverty and ill health, painted England in dark colours as a country hastening to its ruin. His message was old and yet new, for men had forgotten it, as they always have from age to age. This was an age of competition, of supply and demand. Brotherly love had been forgotten, and cash payment had taken its place. Carlyle denounced this system as the shabbiest gospel that had been taught among men. He urged upon government the fact that it was their duty to educate and to uplift the masses, and upon the masters that they should look upon their workers as something more than money-making machines. The old system of guilds, in which the apprentice was under the master's direct care, had gone, and nothing had been put in its place. The value of Carlyle's teaching lies in the fact that he insisted upon the sanctity of work. All true work is religion, he said, and the essence of every true religion is to be found in the words, Know thy work and do it. The best of the worth of every nation is to be found in their standard of life and work and their rejection of a life of idleness. To make some nook of God's creation a little fruitfuller, better, more worthy of God, to make some human hearts a little wiser, manfuller, happier, more blessed, less accursed. It is work for a God. Unstained by wasteful deformities, by wasted tears or heart's blood of men, or any defacement of the pit, noble fruitful labour, growing ever nobler, will come forth, the grand sole miracle of man, whereby man has risen from the low places of this earth, very literally into divine heavens, plowers, spinners, builders, prophets, poets, kings, all martyrs and noblemen, and gods are of one grand host, immeasurable, marching ever forward since the beginnings of the world. Carlyle was, above all things, sincere. He looked into the heart of things and hated half-beliefs. Men, he said, were accustoming themselves to say what they did not believe in their heart of hearts. The standard of English work had become lower, it was cheap and nasty, and this in itself was a moral evil. Good must in time prevail over evil. The Christian religion was the strongest thing in the world, and for this reason had conquered. He believed in wise compassion. That is to say, he kept his sympathy for those who truly deserved it. For the mass of struggling workers, with few or none to voice their bitter wrongs. His teachings are a moral tonic for the age, and though for a long time they were unpopular and distasteful to the majority, yet he lived to see much accomplished, for which he had so earnestly striven. Literature was beginning to take a new form. The novel of polite society was giving place to the novel which pictured life in cruder and harsher colours. The life of the toiling north, of the cotton spinners and weavers, was as yet unknown to most people. In 1848 appeared Mary Barton, a book dealing with the problems of working life in Manchester. 
Mrs. Gaskell, its author, who is best known to most readers by her masterpiece Cranford, achieved an instant success and became acquainted with many literary celebrities, including Ruskin, Dickens and Charlotte Bronte, whose life she wrote. Mary Barton was written from the point of view of labour, and North and South, which followed some years later from that of Capital. Her books are exact pictures of what she saw around her during her life in Manchester, and many incidents from her own life appear in their pages. North and South shows us the struggle, not only between master and men, as representing capital and labour, but also between ancient and modern civilizations. The South is agricultural, easy-going, idyllic. The North is stern, rude, and full of a consuming energy and passion for work. These are the two Englands of Mrs. Gaskell's time, the ways of the manufacturing districts, which seem unpleasing to those who do not really know them, are described with a faithful yet kindly pen, and we see that each life has its trials and its temptations. In the South all is not sunshine, and the life of the labourer can be very hard. A young person can stand it, but an old man gets racked with rheumatism and bent and withered before his time, yet he must work on the same, or else go to the workhouse. In the North, men are often at enmity with their masters, and fight them by means of the strike. Stay to trade. That's just a piece of master's humbug. It's rate of wages I was talking of. The masters keep the state of trade in their own hands, and just walk it forward like a black bugaboo, to frighten naughty children with, into being good. I'll tell you it's their part, their cue, as some folks call it, to beat us down to swell their fortunes, and it's ours to stand up and fight hard, not for ourselves alone, but for them round about us, for justice and fair play. We help to make their profits, and we ought to help spend them. It's not that we want their brass so much this time, as we've done many a time before. We're getting money laid by, and we're resolved to stand and fall together. Not a man on us will go in for less wage than the union says is our due. So I say, hooray for the strike. The story appeared in Household Words, a new magazine of which Charles Dickens was the editor. He expressed a special admiration for the fairness with which Mrs Gaskell had spoken of both sides. Nicholas Higgins, whose words are quoted above, is a type of the best Lancashire workman who holds out for the good of the cause, even though it might mean ruin and poverty to himself. That's what folk call fine and honourable in a soldier, and why not in a poor weaver chap? Dickens himself wrote Hard Times, dealing with the same subject. This appeared about the same time, and the two books should be read and compared, for although Hard Times is not equal in any way to North and South, it is interesting. As Ruskin said of Dickens' stories, allowing for the manner of telling them, the things he tells us are always true. He is entirely right, in his main drift and purpose in every book he has written. And all of them, but especially hard times, should be studied with close and earnest care by persons interested in social questions. During all these years, the Chartists had been vainly struggling to force Parliament to proceed with reform of their grievances. In 1848, a monster petition was to be presented to both houses by their leaders, but London was garrisoned by troops under the Duke of Wellington on the fateful day, and the Chartist army broke up, never to be reunited. Quarrels among themselves proved, in the end, fatal to their cause. A new party, the Christian Socialists, took their place. Force gave way to union and cooperation. A new champion, Charles Kingsley, or Parson Lott, stood forth as the Chartist leader. The hard winter and general distress of the year 1848 nearly provoked another rising, and in his novel entitled Yeast, Kingsley pictures the condition of England question as it appeared to one who knew it from the seamy side. Especially did he blame the church, which, he said, offered a religion for Jacob the smooth man and was not suited for poor Esau. This was indeed most true as regards the agricultural classes, where the want was felt of a real religion which should gain a hold upon a population which year by year was fast drifting loose 
from all ties of morality and Christianity. The peasantry, once the mainstay of England, and now trodden down and neglected, cannot rise alone and without help from those above them. What right have we to keep them down? What right have we to say that they shall know no higher recreation than the hogs? Because, forsooth, if we raise them, they might refuse to work for us. Are we to fix how far their minds may be developed? Has not God fixed it for us, when he gave them the same passions, talents, tastes as our own? The farm labourer, unlike his brothers in the north, had no spirit left to strike. His sole enjoyment, such as it was, consisted in recalling the glorious times before the war, when there was more food than there were mouths, and more work than there were hands. I say, father, drawled out someone, they say there's a sight more money in England now than there was afore the war time. Is boy, said the old man, but it's got into too few hands. The system of sweating among the London tailors had grown to such an extent that Kingsley was determined, if possible, to put an end to it, and with this purpose in view, he wrote, cheap clothes and nasty. The government itself, he declares, does nothing to prevent the sweating. The workmen declare that government contract work is the worst of all, and the starved out and sweated out tailor's last resource. There are more clergymen among the customers than any other class, and often we have to work at home upon the Sunday at their clothes in order to get a living. He followed this up with Alton Locke, dealing especially with the life and conditions of work of the journeymen tailors and the Chartist riots. Both sides received some hard knocks, for Kingsley was a born fighter, and his courage and fearlessness won him many friends, even amongst the most violent of the Chartists. The character of Alton Locke was probably drawn from life, and was intended to be William Lovett, at one time a leader in the Chartist ranks. After a long fight with poverty, when he frequently went without a meal, in order to save the money necessary for his education, he rose to a position of some influence. He was one of the first to propose that museums and public galleries should be opened on Sundays, for he declared that most of the intemperance and vice was owing to the want of wholesome and rational recreation. He insisted that it was necessary to create a moral, sober and thinking working class in order to enable them to carry through the reforms for which they were struggling. Disgust with the violent methods of many of his associates caused him at last to withdraw from their ranks. Kingsley looked up to Carlyle as his master, to whom he owed more than to any other man. Of the general effect, he said, which his works had upon me, I shall say nothing. It was the same as they have had, thank God, on thousands of my class and every other. When, finally, violent methods proved of no avail, and the Chartist party dissolved, the democratic movement took a fresh lease of life. As Carlyle had already pointed out, the question of the people was a knife and fork question. That is to say, so long as taxes were levied upon the necessities of life, the poorer classes, who could least of all afford to pay, would become poorer. Sir Robert Peel was the first to remove this injustice, by substituting a tax upon income for the hundred and one taxes which had pressed so heavily upon the poor. Manufacturers were now able to buy their raw materials at a lower price, and need no longer pay such low wages to keep up their profits. In 1845, Peel went a step farther, and in order to relieve the famine in Ireland, he removed the duty on corn. Thus, since corn could now be imported free, bread became cheaper. The Corn Law Repealers had fought for years to bring this about. Their leader and poet, Ebenezer Elliot, declared that what they wanted was bread in exchange for their cottons, woolens and hardware, and no other thing can supply the want of that one thing, any more than water could supply the want of air in the black hole of Calcutta. Bad government is the deadly will that takes what labour ought to keep it is the deadly power that makes bread dear and labour cheap. It was not until there had been many riots and much bloodshed that the Irish famine forced Peel at last to give way. A third party of reformers were working for the same end. 
This was the Young England Party, whose leader was Disraeli, a rising young politician. By birth a Jew, he had joined the English Church and the ranks of the Tory Party. His early works are chiefly sketches of social and political life, and are not concerned with the question of the people. He took as his motto the word Shakespeare puts into ancient Pistol's mouth. Why then the world's mine oyster, which I with sword will open? thus showing at an early age that he had a firm belief in his own powers. From the beginning of his career, he never hesitated in championing the cause of the people, and declared that he was not afraid or ashamed to say that he wished more sympathy had been shown on both sides towards the Chartists. The people had begun to look upon the upper classes as their oppressors, who were living in comfort upon the profits wrung from their poorer brethren. Thomas Cooper, in his autobiography, describes the reckless and irreligious spirit which continued poverty was creating among the half-starved weavers. Let us be patient a little longer, lads. Surely God Almighty will help us. Talk no more about thy God Almighty, was the sneering reply. There isn't one. If there was one, he wouldn't let us suffer as we do. The Chartists were opposed to the anti-corn law party, for they thought that the cry of cheap bread meant simply low wages and was a trap set to catch them unawares. The Young England Party believed in themselves as the leaders of a movement which should save England through its youth. They were, however, known in Parliament in their early days as young gentlemen who wore white waistcoats and wrote spoony poetry. Young England wished for a return of the feudal relations between the nobility and their vassals. The nobles and the church, as in olden days, were to stretch out a helping hand to the poor, to feed the hungry and succour the distressed. National customs were to be revived. Commerce and art were to be fostered by wealthy patrons. The crown was once more to be in touch with the people. If royalty did but condescend to lower itself to a familiarity with the people, it is curious that they will raise, exalt and adore it, sometimes even invest it with divine and mysterious attributes. If, on the contrary, it shuts itself up in an august seclusion, it will be mocked and caricatured. If the great only knew what stress the poor lay by the few forms that remained to join them, they would make many sacrifices for their maintenance and preservation. It was to lay the views of his party and himself before the public that Disraeli published the three novels, Coningsby, Sybil and Tancred. Coningsby deals with the political parties of that time and is full of thinly disguised portraits of people then living. Sybil, from which a quotation is given elsewhere, is a study of life among the working classes. Tancred discusses what part the church should take in the government of the people. Though the life of the Young England Party was short, it succeeded by means of agitation in and out of Parliament in calling public attention to the harshness of the new poor law and the need for social reform. Carlyle was again the writer who influenced the young Disraeli, for the latter saw that to accomplish anything of real value, he must form his own party and break loose from the worn-out beliefs and prejudices of both political parties. Though in later days he will be remembered as a statesman rather than as a novelist, it is necessary to study those three books in order to understand what England and the English were in Victoria's early years. Each of these reform parties had rendered signal service in their own fashion. Church, government and people were no longer disunited. Distinctions of class had been broken down, and with their disappearance, Chartism came to an end. The failure of the physical force Chartists in 1848 had served to enforce the lesson taught by Carlyle and Kingsley, that the way to gain reform was not through deeds of violence and bloodshed. Each man must learn to fit himself for his part in the great movement toward reform. Intelligence, not force, must be their weapon. After years of bitter strife between the two nations, England, at last, enjoyed peace within her own borders. That peace which a patriot poet, Ernest Jones, during a time of bitter trial, had so earnestly prayed for. God of battles, give us peace, rich with honours proud increase, peace that frees the fettered brave, 
peace that scorns to make a slave, peace that spurns a tyrant's hand, peace that lifts each fallen land, peace of peoples, not of kings, peace that conquering freedom brings, peace that bids oppression cease, God of battles, give us peace. Appendix to Chapter 6 1838, The Chartist Movement The Chartists demanded annual parliaments, manhood suffrage, vote by ballot, equal electoral districts, abolition of the property qualification for members of parliament, payment for members of parliament. The Reform Act of 1832 had brought the middle classes into power and the working classes were now striving to better their own lives. 1842 a motion for free trade defeated in Parliament by a large majority. 1843. Agitation in Ireland for the repeal of the Union. Daniel O'Connell, the leader, arrested. He was found guilty of conspiracy, but his sentence was afterward revoked by the House of Lords. 1845. Failure of the potato crop in Ireland. 1846. Repeal of the Corn Laws in order to open the ports free to foodstuffs. Free trade established and the prices of food begin to fall. 1848. The year of revolution. France proclaims a republic with Prince Louis Napoleon, nephew of Napoleon I, as its president. Risings in Austria and Italy. Renewal of the Chartist agitation. The meeting in London to present a petition to Parliament proves a failure. 1853 to 56. Years of prosperity owing to free trade and growth of intelligence among the working classes prove the chief causes of the death of Chartism. The workers now begin to aim at reforms through their trade unions. The cooperative movement set on foot in Rochdale in 1844 leads to the formation of many other branches. Thomas Carlyle, 1795 to 1881. His writings, more than those of any other man, give us a key to the meaning of the early Victorian age. 1839, Chartism. 1841, Heroes and Hero Worship. 1843, Past and Present. 1850, Latter-day Pamphlets. Charles Dickens, 1812 to 1870. 1836, Pickwick Papers. 1838, Oliver Twist, The Evils of the Workhouse. 1850, David Copperfield, contains sketches of Dickens' early life. 1853, Hard Times. 1857, Little Dorrit, The Marshall Sea Prison for Debtors. Disraeli, Lord Beaconsfield, 1804 to 1881. 1844, Coningsby, Political Life and the Young England Policy. 1845, Sybil, The Claims of the People. 1847, Tancred, The Church and the State. Ebony's Elliot, 1781 to 1849. 1828, Corn Law Rhymes, The Poet of the Workers and of Sorrow. Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell, 1810 to 1865, 1848, Mary Barton, Industrial Lancashire during the crisis of 1842, 1855, North and South, the struggle between master and man, Charles Kingsley, 1819 to 1875, 1848, Yeast, the hard lives of the agricultural labourers, 1850, Alton Locke, Life and Labour of the City Poor. The Prince Consort was a great admirer of the works of Charles Kingsley, which, he said, in speaking of two years ago, showed profound knowledge of human nature and insight into the relations between man, his actions, his destiny and God. The Queen was also one of his admirers, and in 1859 she appointed him one of her chaplains, Later on, he delivered a series of lectures on history to the Prince of Wales. Charles Reed, 
1814 to 1884. 1856. It is never too late to mend. Life in an English prison. 1863. Hard cash. An exposure of bad administration of lunatic asylums. John Ruskin. 1819 to 1900. 1859. The Two Paths. 1862. Unto This Last. 1871. Fors Clavigera. In the last named book, Ruskin describes the scheme of his St. George's Guild, an attempt to restore happiness to England by allying art and science with commercial industry. End of chapter 6of Queen Victoria by E. Gordon Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Chapter 7. The Children of England. From the folding of its robe it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance, the girl is want. Beware them both, and all of their degree, but most of all beware this boy, for on this brow I see that written which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. In surveying the long reign of Queen Victoria, nothing strikes one more than the gradual growth of interest in children and the many changes in the nation's ideas of their upbringing and education. At the beginning of her reign, the little children of the poor were for the most part slaves and were often punished more cruelly by their taskmasters than the slaves one reads of in Uncle Tom's cabin. When Disraeli, afterward Lord Beaconsfield and Prime Minister, wrote Sybil, he drew in that book a terrible picture of the life of children in the manufacturing districts and in the country villages. The following extract speaks for itself. There are many in this town who are ignorant of their very names, very few who can spell them. It is rare that you meet with a young person who knows his own age, rarer to find the boy who has seen a book or the girl who has seen a flower. Ask them the name of their sovereign and they will laugh. Who rules them on earth? or who can save them in heaven, are alike mysteries to them. In such a town as Disraeli describes, there were no schools of any kind, and the masters treated their apprentices as the Mamelukes treated the Egyptians. The author declares that there is more serfdom now in England than at any time since the conquest. The people were better clothed, better fed, and better lodged just before the War of the Roses than they are at this moment. The average term of life among the working classes is 17. One of the first results of machinery taking the place of human labour was that an enormous number of women and young children of both sexes were employed in the factories in place of grown men who were no longer needed. Especially in the spinning mills, thousands of men were thrown out of work and lower wages were paid to those who took their place. This led directly to the breaking up of the home and home life. The wives were often obliged to spend 12 to 13 hours a day in the mills. The very young children, left to themselves, grew up like wild weeds and were often put out to nurse at a shilling or 18 pence a day. One reads of tired children driven to their work with blows, of children who, too tired to go home, hide away in the wool in the drying room to sleep there, and could only be driven out of the factory with straps. How many hundreds came home so tired every night that they could eat no supper for sleepiness and want of appetite, that their parents found them kneeling by the bedside where they had fallen asleep during their prayers? Elizabeth Barrett Browning, one of the greatest poets of Victoria's reign, pleads for mercy and human kindness in her cry of the children. Do ye hear the children weeping, O oh my brothers? ere the sorrow comes with years. They are leaning their young heads against their mothers, and that cannot stop their tears. 
the young lambs are bleating in the meadows, the young birds are chirping in the nest, the young fawns are playing with the shadows, the young flowers are blowing toward the west. But the young, young children, O oh my brothers, they are weeping bitterly, they are weeping in the playtime of the others, in the country of the free. For, O oh, say the children, we are weary, and we cannot run or leap, if we cared for any meadows, it were merely to drop down in them and sleep. Our knees tremble sorely in the stooping. We fall upon our faces trying to go, and, underneath our heavy eyelids drooping, the reddest flower would look as pale as snow. For all day we drag our burden tiring through the cold, dark underground, or all day we drive the wheels of iron in the factories round and round. In the country, the state of affairs was no better. New systems of industrial production threw large numbers of farmhands out of work. The rate of wages fell, and machinery, steam, and the work of women and children took the place of the labourer. The children found a champion in Lord Ashley, afterward Lord Shaftesbury, who succeeded in the face of much opposition in his efforts to pass laws which should do away with such shameful wrong and injustice. The increased amount of coal used, 15.5 million tonnes at the beginning of the century, 64.5 million tonnes in 1854, naturally led to the demand for more workers, and it was owing to this that the proposals of Lord Shaftesbury met with such opposition from the mine owners, and it was owing to this that the proposals of Lord Shaftesbury met with such opposition from the mine owners, who feared that if child labour were made illegal, they would not have sufficient hands to work the mines, and they would have to pay higher wages. The Act of 1842 forbade altogether the employment of women and girls in the mines, and allowed only boys of the age of ten or more to do such work. The poor law guardians of the time used to send children into the mines at the age of seven as a means of finding employment for them. The hours of work were limited to ten daily and fifty-eight each week. Little or no attempt was made in the bill to give children the means of obtaining a good education, although considerably more than half of the children in the country never went to school at all, and many large towns were without a proper school. By a previous Factory Act of 1834, all children under 14 years of age were compelled to attend school for two hours daily. The employer was allowed to deduct one penny a week from the child's wages to pay the teacher. This proved absolutely useless as the masters employed worn-out workers as teachers, and in consequence the children learnt nothing at all. It was not until the year 1870 that a bill was passed in Parliament to create an adequate number of public elementary schools for every district in the kingdom. To show the increase in the number of schools built, there were in the year 1854 3,825, and in the year 1885, 21,976. But the children of England owe almost as much to Charles Dickens as they do to Lord Shaftesbury. He was almost the first, and certainly the greatest writer, who with a heart overflowing with sympathy for little children, has left us in his books a gallery of portraits which no one can ever forget. He himself, a very small and not over particularly taken care of boy, passed through a time of bitter poverty, and his stay at school, short as it was, was not a period of his life upon which he looked back with any pleasure. The material for his books was drawn from life, from his own, and from the lives of those around him, and for this reason all that he wrote will always be of great value, as it gives us a good idea of the early and mid-Victorian days. His ambition was to strike a blow for the poor, to leave one's hand upon the time, lastingly upon the time, with one tender touch for the mass of toiling people. Who can ever forget in the Christmas carol the crippled tiny Tim, who behaved as good as gold and better? Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day, who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Other pictures of suffering childhood are Little Nell and the Marchioness in the old curiosity shop, Joe and Charlie in Bleak House, and Smike, 
the victim of the inhuman schoolmaster squares. The cruelty of the times is shown in the case of an unfortunate sempress who tried to earn a living by making shirts for three halfpence each. Once, when she had been robbed of her earnings, she tried to drown herself. The inhuman magistrate before whom she was brought told her that she had no hope of mercy in this world. It was after hearing of this from Charles Dickens that Thomas Hood wrote the well-known Song of the Shirt. Work, 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 from weary chime to chime, Work, 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 as prisoners work for crime. Band and gusset and seam, seam and gusset and band, till the heart is sick and the brain benumbed, as well as the weary hand. The age might well take to heart the lesson taught by the great souled writer that the two chief enemies of the times were ignorance and want. The lot of the unfortunate children in the union workhouses was no better. They were treated rather worse than animals with no sympathy or kindness, owing to the ignorance of those who were set in authority over them. Any one who reads Oliver Twist may learn the nature of the life led by the pauper children in those good old days. The members of this board were very sage, deep, philosophical men, and when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once what ordinary folks would never have discovered. The poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classes. A tavern where there was nothing to pay, a public breakfast, dinner, tea, and supper all the year round. A brick and mortar Elysium, where it was all play and no work. Oh, said the board, looking very knowing. We are the fellows to set this to rights. We'll stop it all in no time. So they established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they, of being starved by a gradual process in the house, or by a quick one out of it. With this view, they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water, and with a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal, and issued three meals of thin gruel a day, with an onion twice a week and half a roll on Sundays. Relief was inseparable from the workhouse and the gruel, and that frightened people. A movement which helped, possibly far more than any other, to better the lot of the children of the poor, commenced with the foundation of the ragged school union, of which the Queen became the patroness. Out of this sprang a small army of agencies for well-doing, commencing only with evening schools, which soon proved insufficient. The founders established day schools, with classes for exercise and industrial training. Children were sent to our colonies where they would have a better chance of making a fair start in life. Training ships, cripples' homes, penny banks, holiday homes followed, and from these again the numerous homes and orphanages which entitle us to call the Victorian age the age of kindness to children. Charles Dickens took the keenest interest in the work of the ragged schools. A letter from Lord Shaftesbury quoted in his life, gives a clear idea of the marvellous work they had accomplished up to the year 1871. After a period of 27 years, from a single school of five small infants, the work has grown into a cluster of some 300 schools, an aggregate of nearly 30,000 children, and a body of 3,000 voluntary teachers, most of them the sons and daughters of toil. Of more than 300,000 children, which, on the most moderate calculation, we have a right to conclude have passed through these schools since their commencement. I venture to affirm that more than a hundred thousand of both sexes have been placed out in various ways, in emigration, in the marine, in trades and in domestic service. For many consecutive years I have contributed prizes to thousands of the scholars, and let no one omit to call to mind what these children were, whence they came and whither they were going, without this merciful intervention they would have been added to the perilous swarm of the wild, the lawless, the wretched, and the ignorant, instead of being, as by God's blessing they are, decent and comfortable, earning an honest livelihood, and adorning the community to which they belong. Dickens believed, first of all, in teaching children cleanliness and decency, before attempting anything in the form of education. Give him and his, he said, a glimpse of heaven, through a little of its light and air, give them water, help them to be clean, lighten the heavy atmosphere in which their spirits flag, 
and which makes them the callous things they are. And then, but not before, they will be brought willingly to hear of him, whose thoughts were so much with the wretched, and who had compassion for all human sorrow. End of chapter 7「Queen Victoria » by E. Gordon Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Chapter 8. Ministering Women. Honour those whose words or deeds thus help us in our daily needs, and by their overflow raise us from what is low. Longfellow. No account of the reign of Queen Victoria would be complete, without some reference to the achievements of women, more especially when the work has had for its chief end and aim the alleviation of suffering. Woman has taken a leading part in the campaign which has been and is now being ceaselessly carried on against the forces of sin, ignorance and want. In the early years of Victoria's reign the art of sick nursing was scarcely known at all. The worst type of nurse is vividly pictured for us by Charles Dickens in Martin Chuzzlewit. She was a fat old woman, this Mrs. Gamp, with a husky voice and a moist eye, which she had a remarkable power of turning up and only showing the white of it. Having very little neck, it cost her some trouble to look over herself, if one may say so, at those to whom she taught. She wore a very rusty black gown, rather the worse for snuff, and a shawl and bonnet to correspond. In these dilapidated articles of dress she had, on principle, arrayed herself time out of mind on such occasions as the present. The face of Mrs. Gamp, the nose in particular, was somewhat red and swollen, and it was difficult to enjoy her society without becoming conscious of a smell of spirits. For a long time, though it had been recognised that the care of the sick was woman's work, no special training was required from those undertaking it. Florence Nightingale did away with all such wrong ideas. In a letter on the subject of training, she wrote, I would say also to all young ladies who are called to any particular vocation, qualify yourselves for it, as a man does for his work. Don't think you can undertake it otherwise. If you are called to man's work, do not exact a woman's privileges, the privilege of inaccuracy, of weakness, you muddleheads. Submit yourselves to the rules of business as men do by which alone you can make God's business succeed, for he has never said that he will give his success and his blessing to inefficiency, to sketchy and unfinished work. She prepared herself for her life's work by years of hard study and ten years' training, visiting all the best institutions in Germany, France and Italy. She gave up a life of ease and comfort in order to develop her natural gift to the utmost. Her opportunity was not long in coming, in 1854, the Crimean War broke out. Most of the generals in the English army were old men whose experience of actual warfare dated back to the early days of the century. Everything was hopelessly mismanaged from the beginning. In August, the English and French allied forces moved against the fortress of Sebastopol, from which Russia was threatening an attack on Constantinople. Troops were landed in a hostile country without the means of moving them away again. There was little or no provision made to transport food, baggage or medical stores. After the victory of Alma, Lord Raglan marched on to Balaclava, and here the transport utterly broke down. The soldiers, in addition to undertaking hard fighting, were forced to turn themselves into pack mules and tramp fourteen miles through the mud in the depth of winter in order to obtain food and warm blankets for their comrades and themselves. Their condition rapidly became terrible. The clothing wore to rags. Their boots, mostly of poor quality, gave out entirely. Their food, such as it was, consisted of biscuit, salt beef or pork and rum. No vegetables could be obtained, and for want of green food, scurvy broke out amongst the troops. Stores were left decaying in the holes of transport, and the doctors were forced to see men dying before their eyes without the means of helping them. The loss of life from the actual fighting was considerable, but more particularly so from the insanitary condition of the camp and the wretched hospital arrangements. The actual figures of our losses in the war speak for themselves. Out of a total loss of 20,656, 
only 2,598 fell in battle. 18,058 died from other causes in hospital. Several regiments lost nearly all their men, and during the first seven months of the siege, men died so fast that in a year and a half no army would have been left at all. William Russell, the special correspondent of the Times, first brought this appalling state of affairs to the notice of the public, and the nation at last woke up. A universal outburst of indignation forced ministers to act and to act quickly. Stores were hurried to the front, fresh troops were sent out to relieve the almost exhausted remnants of the army, and on the 21st of October, Florence Nightingale, with a band of nurses, set sail. She arrived on the very eve of the Battle of Inkerman. Within a few months of her arrival, it is estimated that she had no fewer than 10,000 sick men in her charge, and the rows of beds in one hospital alone measured two and one-third miles in length. Her influence over the rough soldiers was extraordinary. One of them said of her, She would speak to one and another, and nod and smile to many more, but she could not do it all, you know. We lay there in hundreds, but we could kiss her shadow as it fell, and lay our heads on the pillow again, content. Out of chaos she made order, and there were no more complaints of waste and inefficiency. She never quitted her post until the war was at an end, and on her return to England she received a national welcome. She was received by the Queen and presented with a jewel in commemoration of her work, and no less than £50,000 was subscribed by the nation, a sum which was presented by Miss Nightingale to the hospitals to defray the expenses of training nurses. Since this time no war between civilised peoples has taken place without trained nurses being found in the ranks of both armies, and at the Convention of Geneva some years later, it was agreed that in time of war all ambulances, military hospitals, etc., should be regarded as neutral, and that doctors and nurses should be considered as non-combatants. Nursing rapidly became a profession, and from the military it spread to the civil hospitals, which were used as training schools for all who took up the work. Florence Nightingale's advice was sought by the government and freely given upon every matter which affected the health of the people, and it is entirely owing to her influence and example that speedy reforms were carried out, especially in the army. Her noble work was celebrated by Longfellow in his poem, Santa Philomena, often better known as The Lady with the Lamp. Thus thought I, as by night I read, of the great army of the dead, the trenches cold and damp, the starved and frozen camp, the wounded from the battle plain, in dreary hospitals of pain, the cheerless corridors, the cold and stony floors. Lo, in that house of misery, a lady with a lamp I see, pass through the glimmering gloom, and flit from room to room. And slow, as in a dream of bliss, the speechless sufferer turns to kiss, a shadow as it falls, upon the darkening walls. The Queen followed the course of the war with painful interest. This is a terrible season of mourning and sorrow, she wrote. How many mothers, wives, sisters, and children are bereaved at this moment? Alas, it is that awful accompaniment of war, disease, which is so much more to be dreaded than the fighting itself. And again, after a visit to Chatham, 450 of my dear, brave, noble heroes I saw, and thank God upon the whole, all in a very satisfactory state of recovery. Such patience and resignation, courage and anxiety to return to their service, such fine men. Many acts had been passed in previous reigns, to improve the disgraceful state of the prisons in this country, but it was left to a band of workers, mostly Quakers, led by Elizabeth Fry, to bring about any real improvement. Anybody who wishes to read what dens of filth and hotbeds of infection prisons were at this time, need only read the account of the Fleet Prison in the Pickwick Papers and of the Marshall Sea in Little Dorrit. Reform proved at first to be a very slow and difficult matter. New laws passed in 1823 and 1824 insisted upon cleanliness and regular labour for all prisoners. Chaplains and matrons for female prisoners were appointed. The public, however, got the idea, as in the case of workhouses, that things were being made too comfortable for the inmates, and the Society for the Improvement of Prison Discipline was bitterly attacked. Mrs Fry had started work in Newgate Prison, 
then justly considered to be the worst of all the bad prisons in the country. The condition of the women and children was too dreadful to describe, and she felt that the only way to introduce law and decency into this hell upon earth was by influencing the children. She founded a school in the prison, and it was not long before there was a marked improvement in the appearance and behaviour of both the children and the women. The success of her work attracted public attention, and a committee of the House of Commons was appointed to inquire into the condition of the London prisons. Mrs. Fry was called upon to give evidence, and she recommended several improvements. For example, that prisoners should be given some useful work to do, that rewards should be given for good behaviour, and that female warders should be appointed. She visited other countries in order to study foreign prison systems, and her work in the prisons led her to consider what could be done to improve the condition of the unfortunate women who were transported as convicts. She succeeded in improving matters so much that female warders were provided on board ship and proper accommodation and care on their arrival at their destination. Even such a tender-hearted man and friend of the poor as Thomas Hood, author of Song of the Shirt, misunderstood Mrs. Fry's aims, for in a poem called A Friendly Address to Mrs. Fry, he wrote, No, I will be your friend, and, like a friend, point out your very worst defects. Nay, never, start at that word. But I must ask you why. You keep your school in Newgate, Mrs. Fry. Your classes may increase, but I must grieve, over your pupils at their bread and waters. Oh, though it costs you rent and rooms run high, keep your school out of Newgate, Mrs. Fry. In the face of domestic sorrows and misfortunes, Mrs. Fry persevered until the day of her death in 1845 in working for the good of others. The work in this direction was continued by Mary Carpenter, whose father was the headmaster of a Bristol school. She began her life's work after a severe outbreak of cholera in Bristol in 1832. At this time there were practically no reformatory or industrial schools in the country, and Mary Carpenter set to work with some friends to found an institution near Bristol. She worked to save children, especially those whose lives were spent in the midst of sin and wickedness from becoming criminals, and in order to bring this about, she aimed at making their surroundings as homelike and cheerful as possible. She even helped to teach the children herself, as she found great difficulty in finding good assistance. She wished to convince the government that her methods were right, and so persuade them to set up schools of a similar kind throughout the country. The great Lord Shaftesbury was her chief supporter, but it was not until the year 1854 that Mary Carpenter succeeded in her desire, when a bill was passed establishing reformatory schools. From this time her influence rapidly increased, and it is mainly owing to her efforts that at the present day such precautions are taken to reform young criminals on the sound principle of prevention is better than cure. Mary Carpenter also visited India no fewer than four times in order to arouse public opinion there to the need for the better education of women, and at a later date she went to America, where she had many warm friends and admirers. She had, as was only natural, been keenly interested in the abolition of Negro slavery. One of the most distinguished women in literature during the Victorian age was Harriet Martineau. At an early age it was evident that she was gifted beyond the ordinary, and at seven years old she had read Milton's Paradise Lost and learnt long portions of it by heart. Her health was extremely poor. She suffered as a child with imaginary terrors, which she describes in her autobiography, and she gradually became deaf. She bore this affliction with the greatest courage and cheerfulness, but misfortunes followed one another in rapid succession. Her elder brother died of consumption, her father lost large sums of money in business, and the grief and anxiety so preyed upon his mind that he died, leaving his family very badly off. This, and the loss later on, of the little money they had left, only served to strengthen Miss Martineau's purpose. She studied and wrote until late in the night, and after her first success in literature, when she won all three prizes offered by the Unitarian body for an essay, she set to work on a series of stories which were to illustrate such subjects as the effect of machinery upon wages, free trade, etc. After the manuscript had been refused by numerous publishers, she succeeded in getting it accepted, and the book proved an extraordinary success. She moved to London, and her house soon became the centre where the best of literature and politics could always be discussed. 
She was consulted even by cabinet ministers, but in spite of all the praise and adulation, she remained quite unspoiled. The idea of women taking part in public movements was still not altogether pleasing to the majority of people, who were apt to look upon learned women as blue stockings, a name first used in England in the previous century in rather a contemptuous way. Come, let us touch the string, and try a song to sing, though this is somewhat difficult at starting go, and in our case more than ever, when a desperate endeavour is made to sing the praise of Harry Martineau, of bacon, eggs and butter, rare philosophy she'll utter, not a thing about your house, but she'll take part in O. As to mine, with all my soul, she might take and pay the whole. But that is all my eye, and Harry Martin O. Her political economy is as true as Deuteronomy, and the monster of distress she sticks a dart in O. Yet still he stalks about, and makes a mighty rout, but that we hope's my eye, and Harry Martin O. In 1835 she visited the United States, and here she was able to study the question of slavery. She joined the body of the abolitionists, and as a result was attacked from all sides with the utmost fury, for the northern states stood solid against abolition, but she remained unmoved in her opinion, and when in 1862 the great civil war broke out, her writings were the means of educating public opinion. It was largely due to her that this country did not foolishly support the secession of the southern states from the Union. During a period of five years she was a complete invalid, and some of her best books, including her well-known stories for children, Feats on the Fjord and the Crofton Boys, were written in that time. After her recovery, her life was busier than ever. She wrote articles for the daily papers, but her chief pleasure lay in devising schemes for improving the lot of her poorer neighbours. She organised evening lectures for the people and founded a mechanics institute and a building society. During her lifetime she was the acknowledged leader on all moral questions, especially those which affected the lives of women. It has always been esteemed our special function as women, she said, to mount guard over society and social life, the spring of national existence. End of chapter 8「Queen Victoria」by E. Gordon Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Chapter 9. Balmoral. It was in Balmoral Castle that the husband and wife most loved to be with their children. Here they could lead a simple life, free from all the restraints, small house, small rooms, small establishment. There are no soldiers, and the whole guard of the sovereign consists of a single policeman, who walks about the grounds to keep off impertinent intruders and improper characters. The prince shoots every morning, returns to luncheon, and then they walk or drive. The queen is running in and out of the house all day long, and often goes about alone, walks into the cottages, and chats with the old women. The queen loved her life here even more than the prince, and every year she yearned for it more and more. It is not alone the pure air, the quiet and beautiful scenery, which makes it so delightful, she wrote. It is the atmosphere of loving affection, and the hearty attachment of the people around Balmoral, which warms the heart, and does one good. It was during the year 1848 that the royal couple paid their first visit to Balmoral. The Queen had long wished to possess a home of her own in the Highlands, where her husband could indulge in some outdoor sport, and where they both could enjoy a brief rest from time to time, from the anxiety and care of state affairs. Their life there during the years 1848 to 61 is described by the Queen in her diary. Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands. It was first published after the Prince's death and was dedicated to him in the words, to the dear memory of him who made the life of the writer bright and happy. These simple records are lovingly and gratefully inscribed. The first impressions were very favourable. It is a pretty little castle in the old Scottish style. There is a picturesque tower and garden in front, with a high wooded hill. At the back there is wood down to the Dee, and the hills rise all around. Their household was, naturally, a small one, consisting of the Queen's maid of honour, the Prince's valet, a cook, a footman, and two maids. 
Among the outdoor attendants was John Brown, who in 1858 was attached to the Queen as one of her regular attendants everywhere in the Highlands, and remained in her service until his death. He has all the independence and elevated feelings peculiar to the Highland race, and is singularly straightforward, simple-minded, kind-hearted, and disinterested, always ready to oblige, and of a discretion rarely to be met with. The old castle soon proved to be too small for the family, and in September 1853 the foundation stone of a new house was laid. After the ceremony, the workmen were entertained at dinner, which was followed by Highland games and dancing in the ballroom. Two years later they entered the new castle, which the Queen described as charming, the rooms delightful, the furniture, papers, everything perfection. The Prince was untiring in planning improvements, and in 1856 the Queen wrote, Every year my heart becomes more fixed in this dear paradise, and so much more so now that all has become my dearest Albert's own creation, own work, own building, own laying out as at Osborne, and his great taste and the impress of his dear hand have been stamped everywhere. He was very busy today, settling and arranging many things for next year. Visits to the cottages of the old people on the estate and in the neighbourhood were a constant source of delight and pleasure to the Queen, and often when the Prince was away for the day shooting, she would pay a round of calls, taking with her little presents. The old ladies especially loved to talk with their Queen. The affection of these good people, who are so hearty and so happy to see you, taking interest in everything, is very touching and gratifying, she remarked upon them. We were always in the habit of conversing with the Highlanders, with whom one comes so much in contact in the Highlands. The Prince highly appreciated the good breeding, simplicity and intelligence which make it so pleasant and even instructive to talk to them. In September 1855, soon after moving into the new castle, the news arrived of the fall of Sebastopol, and this was taken as an omen of good luck. The Prince and his suite sallied forth, followed by all the population, to the cairn above Balmoral, and here, amid general cheering, a large bonfire was lit. The pipes played wildly, the people danced and shouted, guns and squibs were fired off, and it was not until close upon midnight that the festivities came to an end. During the same month the Princess Royal became engaged to Prince Frederick William of Prussia, who was then visiting Balmoral. Acting on the Queen's advice, Prince Frederick did not postpone his good fortune until a later date, as he had first intended, but during a ride up Craignaban, he picked a piece of white heather, the emblem of good luck, and offered it to the young princess, and this gave him an opportunity of declaring his love. These extracts printed from the Queen's journals were intended at first for presentation only to members of the royal family and Her Majesty's intimate friends, especially to those who had accompanied her during her tours. It was, however, suggested to the Queen that her people would take even as keen an interest in these simple records of family life, especially as they had already shown sincere and ready sympathy with her personal joys and sorrows. The book, its editor says, is mainly confined to the natural expressions of a mind, rejoicing in the beauties of nature, and throwing itself, with a delight rendered keener by the rarity of its opportunities, into the enjoyment of a life removed for the moment from the pressures of public cares. It is of particular interest because here the Queen records from day to day her thoughts and her impressions in the simplest language. Here she can be seen less as a Queen than as a wife and mother. Her interest in her whole household and in all those immediately around her is evident on almost every page. To quote again, she is indeed the mother of her people, taking the deepest interest in all that concerns them, without respect of persons from the highest to the lowest. As a picture of the royal court in those days, this is exceedingly valuable, for it shows what an example the Queen and her husband were setting to the whole nation in the simple life they led in their highland home. That the old people especially loved her can be seen from the greetings and blessings she received in the cottages she used to visit. May the Lord attend ye with mirth and with joy. May he ever be with ye in this world and when ye leave it. The Queen was never weary of the beauties of the Highlands, and quotes the following lines from a poem by Arthur Hugh Clough to describe God's glorious works. The gorgeous bright October, 
Then, when brackens are changed and heather blooms are faded, and amid russet of heather and fern, green trees are bonny, alders are green and oaks, the rowan scarlet and yellow, one great glory of broad gold pieces appears the aspen, and the jewels of gold that were hung in the hair of the birch tree, pendulous, here and there, her coronet, necklace and earrings cover her now, o'er and o'er, she is weary and scatters them from her. In the year 1883, the Queen published More Leaves from the Journal, and dedicated it to my loyal Highlanders, and especially to the memory of my devoted personal attendant and faithful friend, John Brown. They are records of her life in Scotland during the years 1862 to 1882. In the August of 1862, a huge cairn, 35 feet high, was erected to the memory of the Prince Consort. It was set on the summit of Craig Laurigan, where it could be seen all down the valley. A short extract will serve as a specimen of the Queen's style of writing. At a quarter to twelve, I drove off with Louise and Leopold in the wagonette up to near the bush, the residence of William Brown, the farmer, to see them juice the sheep. This is a practice pursued all over the highlands before the sheep are sent down to the low country for the winter. It is done to preserve the wool. Not far from the burnside, where there are a few hillocks, was a pen in which the sheep were placed, and then, just outside it, a large sort of trough, filled with liquid tobacco and soap, and into this the sheep were dipped one after the other. One man took the sheep, one by one, out of the pen, and turned them on their backs, and then William and he, holding them by their legs, dipped them well in, after which they were let into another pen, into which this trough opened, and here they had to remain to dry. To the left, a little lower down, was a cauldron boiling over a fire, and containing the tobacco with water and soap. This was then emptied into a tub, from which it was transferred into the trough. A very rosy-faced lassie, with a plaid over her head, was superintending this part of the work, and helped to fetch the water from the burn, while children and many collie dogs were grouped about, and several men and shepherds were helping. It was a very curious and picturesque sight. End of chapter 9《Ten of Queen Victoria by E. Gordon Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Chapter 10 The Great Exhibition. The idea of a great exhibition of the works and industries of all nations was Prince Albert's. The scheme, when first proposed in 1849, was coldly received in this country. It was intended to use the prince's own words, to give us a true test and a living picture of the point of development at which the whole of mankind has arrived in this great task, and a new starting point from which all nations will be able to direct their further exertions. The Times led the attack against the proposed site in Hyde Park, and the public was uneasy at the thought of large numbers of foreigners congregating in London and at the expected importation of foreign goods as showing the absurd things which John Bull could say at this time in his jealousy and dislike of foreigners, the Prince wrote, The strangers they give out are certain to commence a thorough revolution here, to murder Victoria and myself, and to proclaim the Red Republic in England. The plague is certain to ensue from the confluence of such vast multitudes, and to swallow up those whom the increased price of everything has not already swept away. For all this I am to be responsible, and against all this I have to make efficient provision. Punch pictured the young prince begging cap in hand for subscriptions. Pity the sorrows of a poor young prince, whose costly schemes have borne him to your door, who in a fix the matter not to mince. Oh, help him out, and commerce swell your store. Such constant worry and anxiety affected the prince's health, but the support of Sir Robert Peel, and of many great firms, gradually wore down the opposition. The building was designed by Paxton, who had risen from being a gardener's boy in the Duke of Devonshire's service to the position of the greatest designer of landscape gardening in the kingdom. He took his main ideas for the Crystal Palace from the great conservatories at Kew and Chatsworth. It was like a huge greenhouse in shape, nearly 1,000 feet long and 90 feet high, 
with fountains playing in the naves, and a great elm tree in full leaf under the roof. On May the 1st, 1851, the opening day, everything went well. The crowds in the streets were immense, and there were some 34,000 visitors present in the building during the opening ceremony. Lord Macaulay was much impressed with the exhibition, for he wrote after the opening, I was struck by the numbers of foreigners in the streets. All, however, were respectable and decent people. I saw none of the men of action with whom the socialists were threatening us. I should think there must have been near 300,000 people in Hyde Park at once. The sight among the green boughs was delightful. The boats and little frigates darting across the lake, the flags, the music, the guns, everything was exhilarating, and the temper of the multitude the best possible. I made my way into the building, a most gorgeous sight, vast, graceful, beyond the dreams of the Arabian romances. I cannot think that the Caesars ever exhibited a more splendid spectacle. I was quite dazzled, and I felt as I did on entering St. Peter's. I wandered about and elbowed my way through the crowd, which filled the nave, admiring the general effect, but not attending much to details. And again on the last day he wrote, Alas, alas, it was a glorious sight, and it is associated in my mind with all whom I love most. I am glad that the building is to be removed. I have no wish to see the corpse when the life has departed. The royal party were received with acclamation all along the route. It was a complete and beautiful triumph, a glorious and touching sight, one which I shall ever be proud of, for my beloved Albert and my country, wrote the Queen. Six million people visited the great fair during the time it remained open. In one respect, however, it could scarcely be considered a triumph for this country. It was still an ugly, and in some respects a vulgar age. The invention of machinery had done little or nothing to raise the level of the public taste for what was appropriate and beautiful in design. That an article cost a large sum of money to manufacture and to purchase seemed sufficient to satisfy the untrained mind. Generally speaking, the taste of the producers was uneducated and much inferior to that of the French. Most of the designs in carpets, hangings, pottery and silks were merely copies and were often extremely ugly. England at this time, the first among the industrial nations, had utterly failed to hold her own in the arts. Machinery had taken the place of handwork, and with the death of the latter, art and industry had ceased to have any relation. Public taste in architecture was equally bad. A revival of the art of the Middle Ages resulted only in a host of poor imitations. Thirty or forty years ago, if you entered a cathedral in France or England, you could say at once, these arches were built in the age of the Conqueror, that capital belonged to the early Henrys. Now all this is changed. You enter a cathedral and admire some ironwork so rude, you are sure it must be old, but which your guide informs you has just been put up by Smith of Coventry. You see some painted glass so badly drawn and so crudely coloured, it must be old, Jones of Newcastle. John Ruskin, who was in many ways the greatest art teacher of his age, was the first to point out the value and the method of correct observation of all that is beautiful in nature and in art. In an address on modern manufacture and design, delivered to the working men of Bradford, he declared, Without observation and experience, no design, without peace and pleasurableness in occupation, and all the lecturings and teachings, and prizes and principles of art in the world, are of no use, so long as you don't surround your men with happy influences and beautiful things. Inform their minds, refine their habits, and you form and refine their designs. But keep them illiterate, uncomfortable, and in the midst of unbeautiful things, and whatever they do will still be spurious, vulgar, and valueless. At the time, however, the exhibition proved a great success, and the Duke of Coburg carried most favourable impressions away with him. He says, The Queen and her husband were at the zenith of their fame. Prince Albert was not satisfied to guide the whole affair only from above. He was, in the fullest sense of the word, the soul of everything. Even his bitterest enemies, with unusual unreserve, acknowledged the completeness of the execution of the scheme. So far from there being a loss upon the undertaking, there was actually half a million of profit. The proceeds were devoted to securing ground at South Kensington, upon which a great national institute might be built. This undertaking, the purchase of the ground, was not carried through without great difficulty and anxiety. The Queen's sympathy and encouragement were, as always, of the greatest help to her husband, and he quoted a verse from a German song, 
to illustrate how much he felt and appreciated it. When man has well nigh lost his hope in life, upwards in trust and love still looks the wife, towards the starry world all bright with cheer, faint not nor fear, thus speaks her shining tear. The great exhibition was sufficient proof, if any had been needed, of how the prince with his wife laboured incessantly for the good of others. Without his courage, perseverance and ability, there is no doubt that this great undertaking would never have been carried through successfully. He recognised the fact that princes live for the benefit of their people. His desire for the improvement in all classes was never ending, and from him his wife learnt many lessons which proved of the greatest value to her in later life, when she stood alone and her husband was no longer there to aid her with his unfailing wise advice. A second exhibition was held in 1862, and so far as decorative art was concerned, there were distinct signs of improvement. Art manufacture had now become a trade phrase, but manufacturers were still far from understanding what art really meant. As an instance of this, one carpet firm sent a carpet to be used as a hanging, on which Napoleon III is depicted presenting a treaty of commerce to the Queen. Particular attention had apparently been paid to the shine on Napoleon's top boots and to the Queen's smile. The Prince's great wish was to restore to the workman his pride in the work of his hands, to relieve the daily toil of some of its irksomeness by the interest thus created in it, and where the work was of a purely mechanical nature and individual skill and judgment were not called for, he wished the worker to understand the principles upon which the machine was built and the ingenuity with which it worked. His schemes for the building and equipment of museums of science and art were arranged with the purpose in view that both rich and poor should have equal opportunities of seeing what improvements had been made throughout the ages, and how vast and far-reaching the effects of such improvements were on the lives of the whole nation. It was under his direction that the pictures in the National Gallery were first arranged in such a manner as to show the history and progress of art. In his own words, "'Our business is not so much to create as to learn to appreciate and understand the works of others.' and we can never do this till we have realised the difficulties to be overcome. Acting on this principle myself, I have always tried to learn the rudiments of art as much as possible. For instance, I learnt oil painting, watercolours, etching, lithography, etc. And in music I learnt thorough bass, the pianoforte, organ and singing, not, of course, with a view of doing anything worth looking at, or hearing, but simply to enable me to judge and appreciate the works of others. It is interesting to note how closely the views of the Prince agreed with those of John Ruskin in matters of art and literature. Ruskin declared that it was the greatest misfortune of the age, that owing to the wholesale introduction of machinery, the designer and maker were nearly always different people, instead of being one and the same person. He declared that no work of art could really be living or capable of moving us to admiration, as did the masterpiece of the Middle Ages, unless the maker had thought out and designed it himself. It was largely owing to his teachings that the arts and crafts movement under William Morris and Walter Crane arose, a movement which has since that time spread over the whole civilised world. In 1862, together with some of his friends, Morris formed a company to encourage the use of beautiful furniture and to introduce art in the house. Morris himself had learnt to be a practical carpet weaver and dyer, and had founded the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. All the work of this firm was done by hand as far as possible. Only the best materials were to be used, and designs were to be original. They manufactured stained glass, wallpaper, tapestry, tiles, embroidery, carpets, etc., and many of the designs were undertaken by Edward Byrne Jones. Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the poet-painter, Holman Hunt, best remembered by his famous picture The Light of the World, and others, formed what was known as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood to instruct public taste in creative work in art and literature. At the Kelmscott Press, some of the most beautiful printed books of their kind were produced under the direction of Morris. Ruskin, like so many others of his time, was greatly influenced by Carlyle, and his views on the condition of England question were practically the same. He bewailed the waste of work and of life, the poverty and the sweating. He urged employers to win the goodwill of those who worked for them as the best means of producing the best work. He preached the rights of labour, that high wages for good work was the truest economy in the end, and that beating down the wages of workers does not pay in the long run. He declared 
that the only education worth having was a humane education, that is, first of all, the building of character and the cultivation of wholesome feelings. You do not educate a man by telling him what he knew not, but by making him what he was not, was the theory which he endeavoured to put into practice by experiments such as an attempt to teach everyone to learn to do something well and accurately with his hands. In common with Wordsworth, Ruskin held that the love of nature was the greatest of educators. He believed that the world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. The beauty and the everlasting marvel of nature's works were, to him as to the poet of the lakes, the real road to knowledge. Come forth into the light of things. Let nature be your teacher. An education of not the brain alone, but of heart and hand as well, all three working in cooperation, was necessary to raise man to the level of an intelligent being. Ruskin's teachings fared no better than those of Carlyle at first, and though he is spoken of sometimes as being old-fashioned, yet his lesson is of the old-fashioned kind which does live and will live, for like Dickens he knew how to appeal to the hearts of his readers. He is one of the most picturesque writers in the language, a man of great nobility of character and generous feelings, who had a tremendous belief in himself, and knew how to express his thoughts in the most beautiful language. Some of his books, for example, Sesame and Lilies, and Unto This Last, are probably destined for immortality. End of chapter 10